Okay, so um, that is the point of this class, and we're going to be talking about lots of different things, lots of different theories, not just rah rah. Uh, as I was telling the students uh, that were here last week, there um, there is a, pop, a more positive correlation between those with just with a positive outlook in life, uh, a higher co correlation with that and success than there is with a GPA of success. There's almost no correlation between your GPA and your success. Um, but positive thinking is a, a pretty good care correlation. But positive thinking is not the only aspect of uh, success by any means. That's just a starting point. That basically positive thinking means that you think you can succeed. Because if you don't think you can succeed, then you're not going to succeed. Uh, you have to believe that, that you can succeed in whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. And so, a positive outlook on life is certainly a, a, perhaps the most important starting point that you believe it. Uh, if you don't believe it, like I say, you can't achieve it. Um, but there are, uh, as, as uh, Denzel Washington said, you know, dreams are one thing and goals and working hard to achieve those goals is something else. Not just, but it's also Working smart to believe those things, and to, to achieve those things. Um, there are a lot of people, as as Denzel mentioned, who work and work and work, and they're basically like running in place, as his mama said. You can run in place and still not, you know, put out lots of energy and still not get anywhere. Uh, and so there are some some essentials to how to get somewhere. Uh, some of those, uh, according to millions of people uh, are reviewed in, in the seven habits of highly effective people. Uh, habits are important and he chose, the author chose that uh, very carefully. Uh, habit is something you do automatically, something you make part of your life. It's not just a rah-rah speech, uh, it's something that you make, as I said, part of your life. We do it consistently. Every day we work on on these certain habits that they, they end with, to the point where we don't have to think about it. It just comes naturally to us. We are going to be, um, basically habits become your character. Um, so, you know, your dreams may be a starting point, but then those dreams have to turn to action and action every day become habits and habits become your character. And your character uh, determines whether you're going to achieve your success or not. And that's one of the things that, uh, that Dr. Covey uh, strongly believes in, is that ultimately uh, he kind of, his book was written um, as, as part of his Ph.D. dissertation, actually, and he, he reviewed lots of success literature. And he determined that most of it was what he would call personality-driven uh, ideas for success. Uh, for example, you know, just to, you know, to walk up to somebody with a big smile and shake their hand and put on the show, you know, and act like, you know, a certain way and people are going to be attracted to you. So that's more personality driven rather than character driven. And he didn't believe that was the best way to achieve long-term success. That ultimately it was, it was more a character uh, and habits that formed those characters that were essential to, to consistently uh, achieve success. And so that's part of uh, what we'll be learning in his book. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm a fan also of Clay Christensen, who has turned the business world upside down, which is his thinking. Um, many of the concepts that are taught in MBA programs, including at Harvard, where he teaches, uh, are he's showing to be false. Um, many of the, the principles that are being taught actually lead to failure. Uh, in many cases, and he his uh, his dissertation and his, the books that he's published since then have have shown that very strongly to to the point that uh, organization after organization have named him the the number one business mind in the world at this time, and uh, we'll so we'll talk uh, about his ideas too from a business perspective and from a personal perspective. As I mentioned, he also wrote a book about you know how do you measure success in your life. Uh, because of the failures of his classmates, his you know genius level classmates that were going out and becoming successful as executives and failing, and going through marriage after marriage and seeing their 
you know, kids raised by somebody else and things like that, and has to raise the question of is that success uh, to do that. Um, so those are all things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the syllabus. And so I'm going to bring that up. So we'll start at the top. So in case you don't know, my name is Ken Harvey. I am an American. I call home uh, Washington State uh, in the northwest part of the United States, but I've lived all over the U.S. and I've lived um, in lots of parts of the world. I uh, lived a couple of years in Central America and Guatemala, El Salvador, taught there. Um, last nine years I've been working in Kazakhstan and teaching at a university there. Most of my life I've been uh, a professional rather than a professor. I've been a newspaper uh, editor and publisher, uh, been a uh, corporate uh, uh, PR marketing uh, director, and lots of other things in my life. Um, I did, uh, in case somebody downloaded this before, I changed my office hours to kind of correlate with when I'm really in my office. Um, and so I will have, I have office hours right after uh, my classes, which on Monday and Wednesday, a different class, uh, I, I might be stuck in the classroom for a few minutes, but then I'll, I'll gradually get over to the office and be there until 12.30. And, I'll, and today and tomorrow I have this class, uh, uh, two different sections of it. And so right after this class, I schedule an hour uh, where I'm available if you need to talk to me. And on uh, Monday, and Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, everything except Tuesday, uh, I'm also almost always in my office uh, at five from 5.30 to 6.30, and you can catch me then too, or by an appointment. I'm, I'm pretty much an open-door sort of professor, and uh, so when you can catch me, uh, unless there's something you know, vital that I have to be doing, I, I'll make time for you. Um, but it's easiest because of the fact that we don't have our own office. Uh, we have, you know, I'm sharing an office with seven other people or something like that, and uh, and so it's, we can't very well meet there for anything very serious, so I need to go someplace else. So if you come to my office, I might not be there because I'm talking to somebody someplace else. So it'd be best if you, you know, email and set up an appointment or ask, you know, uh, to set an appointment uh, here in person. Um, email is better because then the, uh, the email goes to my calendar, and if you, if you talk to me right here and I forget, and, you know, then we, we get things screwed up. So, um, like I said, I, I'm very much uh, uh, somebody who very much wants to see you succeed, um, not just because that's the name of this class, uh, but because that is my goal. That's why I am a professor. Uh, I've done a lot of research on, in my area of communications on uh, how I can help students succeed better. I've interviewed uh like a couple, about like 2,000 uh, communication executives to ask them, what do we do to better prepare your future employees? And so I care enough to do that uh, because I, I think that, it's, that ultimately we kind of make you an unwritten promise that if you come to our university and if you take my classes in particular, uh, that you will be prepared for the real world. And what, what the employers in my field say is that's not true. Uh, for most students in most universities, uh, even in America and other places too. So I have, uh, in my teaching, I have fought the system, so to speak, to try to do the things that the, that the employers think we should be doing because I think they actually know more. And they're the ones that actually give you a job. They're the ones that actually know more about how, to, how they want you to be prepared than do most of your professors. Uh, and so, um, as I said, I've spent, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours trying to figure out how to be, you know, how to help you be successful. And this is one of the ways, and that's why I proposed this class. Um, I used to uh, uh, be part of, a, of a, a program called Le Student Leadership Program for migrant students in America. Migrant students are the lowest of the totem pole, the lowest level of achievement in American schools. Because first off, they probably don't speak English very well. They're probably coming from Mexico in most cases, or Latin America someplace in most cases. They don't speak the language very well. By the very definition of migrant students, that means they're moving a lot. 
their families are moving to harvest crops or to uh, you know work in the fields anyway in a variety of uh, jobs. And so they're moving from school to school. The schools are not coordinated in America. They don't use all the same te textbooks. They don't teach all the same classes. They are not in the same place in the textbooks. They happen to have the same textbooks. So you go from one school to another school, it's like, you know, you're just starting all over again. You don't know the teachers. You don't have friends. You don't have any support system. Uh, you may be living in a car in some cases. Um, you probably don't have access to a computer uh, if you know how to use one at all. Uh, so those were the people we were working with and we knew that statistically half of them would probably drop out of school because of the challenges and because their very families encouraged them to their parents would say you're not doing anything in school you're not going to be anybody you're not going to achieve success you're not going to go to college you're not going to you're just going to be working in the fields like we are so let's stop fooling around wasting your time come out and work in the fields we'll make some money and Maybe someday as a family we might start a business or something. That's their mentality. Uh, and so the parents become the biggest obstacle to the students um, in many cases. But after they take, go through three, a three-day conference with us, uh, the statistics rise from 50% dropout rate to just 20% dropout rate, and the rest are graduating, and many, most of them are going to universities. Because we teach them how to do that. We teach them how to think. We teach them how to set goals, how to achieve goals. Um, and help them believe that it's possible and how to get there. Uh, I also was, uh, taught for a couple of years in a program called the Unemployment Opportunity Center. Uh, a bunch of older people had been laid off from, from the biggest industry in our city, and some of them were literally suicidal because here now some of them were over 50 years old and they didn't know how it was a field that was declining and they didn't think they could get another job within their own field and yet here they were 50 years old or 40 years old or whatever age it was they happened to be and they were out of a job and had no hope that they would get a job in their industry ever again uh, and so um, I taught them Stephen Covey's seven habits and I talked showed them some you know taught them other things as well and many of them came up to me and said basically you saved my life um, you, you help me believe and, and set goals and find a way, you know, believe that I can achieve new goals and start a new career and achieve happiness uh, in a new way. Um, so, like I say, this is not just uh, uh, an assignment somebody gave me that, uh, you know, gee, gee, ought to take this, uh, teach a general aid course. It's something I strongly believe and that I uh, uh, have worked hard at during the years to to make happen for people. I still get uh, on Facebook, I get emails uh, from students that I worked with, migrant students that I worked with 12, 13 years ago, uh, thanking me for, for helping them and encouraging me to keep doing what I do. So even though my profession is communications and my uh, field is, you know, journalism and public relations and stuff like that, this has always, this has been an important part of my life too. Um, so, don't be afraid to come talk to me. The, uh, um, one of the things I point out is in a, in a uh, uh, study done in uh, the United Kingdom, in the UK, they, uh, they, basically, they also asked, uh, and that, they, they asked employee, employers what are the most important things. Uh, last week I showed that. I'm not going to show the chart again. But what it came down to was that eight of the ten uh, top traits or top characteristics that they were looking for had absolutely nothing to do with the per what the person learned in their major. And consequently, some of the universities in, in the UK are asking all of their teachers to start teaching soft skills, start teaching attitudinal uh, traits and characteristics. In other words, start teaching things like we will find in the seven habits of highly effective people because those are the basis in which most people are being hired when they get to the interview. Now, maybe before they get to the interview, they have to, the people are going to look at their CV and say, okay, they, they know the knowledge. We, we believe they know as much, pretty much what other people know. Now, how, why are we going to hire this person instead of somebody else? And that's based on soft skills, ability to communicate, ability to think, ability to work in a group, lots of things that are not 
part of, of your your normal training in your in your uh, uh, major. So that's again one reason why we're doing this course. Uh, I'm going to jump down. You can go through a lot of this stuff on your own. Um, and uh, I, I don't think I will go. I think I'll jump through the the schedule of, uh, of what we're going to be studying. But you know, uh, we're going to go through the book of Seven Habits, uh, and but we'll go through other other materials as well. Uh, there's a textbook that we're going to use called uh, College Success, and uh, you all are actually going to help teach that the content of that book. That's going to be one of your tasks is to give a present a team presentation. And so we'll divide the class into groups to teach the contents of that um, that book. The uh, so we'll, I'm going to go through all this and get down here the important part I guess from some of your perspective. Um, participation five percent, and I'll I'll explain these in a second. Team presentation I mentioned that's out of the uh, uh, will be primarily if not totally out of the college success book. Self-reflective journal. Um, well, let me just, that's 15%. I'll, I'll, there's an, another section here that goes into detail, so let me just go through it quickly. Um, quizzes on, on Moodle, uh, on our e-learning site. Um, there will be quite a few quizzes that are worth nothing. They're worth 0% in preparing you for the quizzes that actually do count. And so there will actually only be uh, three uh, quizzes during the semester that count, and they'll count 10% each. But every week I'll build a quiz to help you understand what sorts of things I'm looking for, what things you should be trying to, to remember, um, and I'll try to make them as relevant as possible. Uh, not just, uh, I'm not going to try to trick you, uh, but I do want to give you incentive to be paying attention to the, the videos I ask you to watch, uh, the the uh, parts of the book I'm asking you to read and things like that so I will uh, I will be um, you know a lot of that is for motivation purposes I, I don't really care about grades that much and in a class like this I will probably get in trouble but I would not mind getting giving everybody an A and so if you do the work you'll get a good grade um, even as it is even in my major courses um, I give the best grades of any of the professors in our department. So, I, 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 like I said earlier, GPA does not relate to success in life. So, to me, it's only about motivation um, and doing what the administration demands I do, <laughs> basically. So, uh, in, but like I said, in a course like this, I, this is not your major. Uh, and if you learn the material, if you participate actively, if you uh, show... Um, in the self-reflective journal that you're really thinking about this stuff and you're trying to consider how to apply it in your lives, uh, then you should get a good grade. Um, and then there will be a final examination, uh, but that uh, a final examination will be largely based on the previous quizzes. Uh, again, I'm not going to try to be tricky with it. Uh, I'm just trying to maybe help you remember the main points of the course. Um, Anyway, I'll, I'll try to, I mean, I, I can't just give people A's. I, I would get in trouble for that. Um, but uh, I don't want to um, make it that difficult to get an A either. So let's go th again through uh, some of these specific items. Um, participation, what's that mean? Uh, students who uh, fail to attend class regularly will not be allowed to pass the course, no matter their, their scores. We already reviewed that. The 5% points, 5 percentage points, however, will be based on participation. During class time, the instructor, me, will call on students to answer questions. So there may be questions that I've already put into the quiz. So I'm going to now ask you to, or they may be slightly different, um, but I'm going to ask some questions of you and call you by name based on the sheet that you uh, just signed in on. And uh, if you do a halfway thoughtful job, uh, you'll get a uh, one percentage point on it. If you don't, then you won't get anything on it, um, or somewhere in between. If you're confused or something, uh, you, it is possible to get a part part of a per one percent. Um, so it's again just incentive to keep your attention. 
and uh, and also to initiate discussion because some of you are kind of shy to talk, and so I want to force you to talk a little bit. And so uh, when I get into the mode of uh, participation, as I said, I'll call on several of you to uh, respond to certain question, a review question, what we talked about last week, or what you should have watched on the uh, on the e-learning site, and that will initiate our discussion and will count a small part of your grade. The presentation that I mentioned, uh, the book, uh, I will, if I haven't already, I'll upload it to the e-learning e site, the middle site, so you have access to the entire book. Uh, and next week I'll pass out a uh, uh, a sign-up sheet for you to sign up for a team. I want to make sure exactly how many people are in the class and then divide up uh, the teams accordingly to, to cover all the chapters of the book. Um, anyway, each uh, team presentation will be about 30 minutes long, so uh, we'll divide it among the students. We'll fine-tune that as we uh, figure out exactly how many students are in the class and, and divide that by how many chapters there are and so forth. Uh, the self-reflection journal I mentioned, there's not a right or wrong to this. There's did you try and didn't try to this, pretty much. Uh, I do not expect uh, perfect spelling and grammar. I expect that you will make it so I understand it. If I understand what you're trying to say, that's sufficient. If you don't make a good enough effort to use good, you know, proper English spelling and spelling and grammar for me to understand, then it might be there might be points deducted based on the fact I do have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, but as long as you make it so that I know what you're talking about, uh, I will overlook uh, some errors in your spelling and grammar. The, uh, so each week, we will, you will record a, a journal entry, somewhere around 200 words. It's not very much. Um, but that journal entry will be basically, what did you get out of... Uh, your studies that week, uh, specifically in this class, uh, in our discussion, in the additional videos I have you watch, in the portions of the books that you're reviewing and so forth, what out of all of that did you, impacted you the most, and how do you think you can apply it in your life? That's self-reflective journal. So this is totally personalized. Uh, none of you will have the same well, if you have exactly the same entry, there's a problem there uh, because you're copying each other. But your, your journals are going to be totally different from one another. All I care about is that you're making an honest effort, that you're doing it, that you're doing the journal, and that it looks like you're making an honest effort to ponder what we're talking about and apply what we're talking about. That's what I'm looking for. So as long as it looks like you put some effort into that, that you've... Uh, you're seriously thinking about how, what success looks like to you and how to achieve success, uh, maybe talking about some of your goals, uh, some of the tools you'll use, some of the habits you want to create, how you will create those habits, whatever, whatever is meaningful to you. Now, in some cases, I may ask a specific question, like this week, um, I will ask a specific question, and that is, what is success to you? Uh, we're going to watch some more videos as well, and we're going to think about this. And there'll, there'll be maybe a couple more videos posted. Those of you that were not here last week, I want you to go back and watch the videos that uh, that are on the Moodle site already and get caught up. Uh, but uh, so I won't add that many for you to watch uh, this week. I'll I'll let you get caught up. Uh, but I want you to watch the videos and uh, think about them and think about what we're talking about in class and. Uh, reflect on it in your journal. Again, 200 words each week is not very much when basically you're, all you're doing is giving me your thoughts. You know, uh, What really appealed to me was this video about this or this teaching by Dr. Covey. Uh, and I, I think that I can apply this habit and build this habit uh, and, and how this I'm going to do it. Um, 200 words is not very much when you're just kind of free thinking, so to speak. And what matters to you and why uh, why it matters and how you will apply it. Uh, so it's not, not a very hard uh, task to do. Um, when you're all done, um, now I will be, what I explain here is I actually, I might give you some tentative grades every week, 
But even if you don't do it, actually, it technically I'm only grading the final product, which is at the very end, you're going to hand in these 200 words a week. So you're going to have something around 3,000 words by the time you're done with your journal. Um, it's just a little piece at a time. Uh, and the ultimate uh, uh, product here that I'm going to grade is the final one. Now, I will give you some feedback every week as you, as you do this. And I might even put a grade on it. If I were grading this by itself, this is what it would get. And so I, uh, I might do that. But it actually won't go into the grade book. And so if I, if I tell you, if I, I might say, you know, I really don't think you put very much effort into this. Um, and I put 50% as, uh, as the, my tentative grade. All that means is, well, maybe you ought to work a little harder. But it actually does not go into a grade book at all. Um, the final grade will be based on your final product at the end of the semester. So uh, I, I don't won't always give you feedback, but um, I, or I maybe won't always give you a lot of feedback. Maybe it's a little bit of feedback or whatever. I may not. I definitely won't always give you a percentage grade. Uh, what I would give you if this were uh, your final part of your final product or an example of your final product. But I will try to give you some feedback so you know whether you're doing okay, um, and not uh, not to be worried about it all semester. That oh gee, I, you know, sweating. I'm, I'm going to flunk this. I'm not doing this right. Now I'll give you enough feedback so you know that you're doing doing okay. Um, and as I mentioned, um, there will be three quizzes uh, administered during the semester as scheduled, each worth ten percent. Uh, other preliminary self-grading quizzes will also be available, but the additional uh, but the additional 10 to 12 quizzes uh, provided on the e-learning system will be for zero points. So they're just but those questions may appear again in one of the uh, one of the other uh, exams if you want to call it an exam. So to get a really good grade, you're going to want to do the weekly quizzes. Uh, they can't hurt you and they can't help you. So um, I will do, I will set up a weekly quiz. They, it will tell you. I'm not going to tell you what I'm, at least my intent is actually not to tell you which questions you missed. Uh, because then you're just going to memorize answers. And you might even share them with somebody else who didn't even bother. So I don't want to do that. But you will get a grade, a percentage grade of, you know, you'll, you'll know how many you got wrong. And so then you have to think about, you know, whether you have to study that a little bit more or not. Um, because, again, because I'm going to use some of those same questions, many of the same questions, on the, the, great, on the exams or the quizzes that do count. And so I don't want to make it, I say I don't want to make it so you're just memorizing answers. I want you to understand what the, what the, uh, the material that the questions represent. And then the final exam will be comprised of questions already seen on the on the 10% uh, quizzes or the 0% quizzes. Um, they may be rewritten slightly in order to again make sure that you understand what your what the answer that you're giving me that you just haven't memorized answers. Uh, so I may change the questions a little bit. Uh, if I in some questions, for example, I might might say which of the following is true. I might rewrite it and say which of the following is not true. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's going to be essentially the same, the same material uh, in almost every case. There might be something really obvious that I didn't ask that I, I might come up with a few more questions for the final. But they're going to be big, big, you know, questions that are major questions that you should, have, should understand, let me put it that way. Um, so, again, the intent is not to be tricky. Uh, you've been exposed, as you know, the grading system has changed this, uh, this semester. Uh, if you're, this is your first semester, I guess you may not know that, but anyway, that's our grading uh, system uh, now. Our textbooks, um, Covey, uh, I'm going to give you a, a uh, make available to you on the e-learning site a condensed version of Covey, and I will make uh, some reading assignments during the semester. So I think the condensed version is like 150 pages or something. 
Um, and so, you know, if we if we divide it up in 15 weeks, but we're already in week two, so we can't do it quite that. But anyway, if we divide it into 10 weeks, expect you to get done in 10 weeks, that'd still be only 15 pages or something. I'm not exactly sure of the exact number of pages, but it's been condensed into about half the size of what the original is in. Uh, so you have some reading to do, but not much. And then the other textbook I will put up in its entirety uh, on the e-learning system. And uh, you can read as much as you want to, but the main thing is uh, you will, uh, like I say, participate in teams to present the content of college success. And, uh, and so anyway, you'll have that book in its entirety. Um, the, uh, the questions will almost certainly come from the PowerPoints and from the presentations the students make. Uh, when you make a presentation, you will do PowerPoints. And in fact, as part of your PowerPoint, you are supposed to create questions. So each participant is supposed to make, uh, I think it says three questions. I don't know if I wrote that specifically up here. Um, if I didn't, uh, anyway, uh, this says at least two. So each participant is to write at least two multiple choice questions based on their portion of the presentation. Um, I usually do three, but we'll say at least two. That's what's in the syllabus now. And so those questions will, if they're written in a, in a, a written well, they make sense, they cover key content, they will probably end up in your, in your quizzes. Uh, so uh, you're helping write the quiz. Okay. Any questions on any of that? Um, other than that, uh, the contents are videos. So you're not going to, I do have, I guess, I have gathered a few other things uh, that might I might include or ask you to read. Um, they're very short uh, and, and they're not very, there's not, I can only think of one other item right now off the top of my mind, maybe two items uh, outside of the uh, two textbooks. And then the videos, uh, two other things that I might have you uh, go through. Um, okay, again, any questions? Okay, well, I'm going to go back and we're going to, um, well, first off, in talking about the uh, videos we've already watched, anything out of those videos that, uh, that struck you that you might want to write about in your, uh, your self-reflective journal? Anybody? Don't be shy. I'd like you to participate in this. Uh, again, that's one reason why I'm going to you know, actually grade some of your participation, but not necessarily right now. But uh, any thoughts you have while you're watching those videos? Uh, the well, a couple of them kind of reflected on on. Uh, Kind of the feeling, do I just give up now? Uh, certainly, the one by by Nick reflected that he you know, tried to commit or he's thinking about committing suicide, initiated the process. Um, others, uh, I think, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is uh, was kind of had to evaluate. You know, he wasn't a winner right away. He wasn't winning. He, he wasn't achieving what he envisioned. Um, and I'm sure that passing through his mind was, you know, why the heck did I come here, travel away from family, come all the way here in the United States to fail? Why did I come here to fail? Um, and so that's why I cried all night that he, said, uh, that he was a failure. He saw so he was a failure at that point. Um, then Bill Washington, as he plunked out of school, probably certainly saw himself as a failure at that point. Uh, he just you know, he was uh, on probation, it sounded like, basically 1.7. A lot of universities could go on probation if you get down to that level. And they go take a semester off, think about it, and uh, we'll give you another semester to try to do better. And if you don't do better next semester, you're gone. Uh, you know, policy of some universities to you know, put you on probation, to you I think about it, give you one more chance. So he was kind of uh, apparently in that situation, for you one more chance. And somebody just giving him encouragement in his mom's beauty parlor, of all things. Uh, you know, you are going to be something. You're going to travel the world and talk to, and talk to millions of people. Um, that obviously affected him. 
somebody believed in him. At that point, he probably didn't believe in himself. As I said, he's on probation, finally out of school, and somebody, you know, thinking about just quitting and going in the military, and somebody says, no, you're special. You're going you're gonna to make this. Um, so I think probably all three of them have, you know, thought about quitting. Because I think, uh, frankly, everybody thinks about quitting. But what the heck am I doing? Or is it worth the effort that I'm putting into this? Um, I've had thoughts like that at different times. And if you haven't, you will. I'm sure you have already. I've pondered that question at times. Well, let's take a look at a uh, couple more uh, uh, videos here. a total and abject failure. So I used to be 60 pounds heavier, and I grew up in a morbidly obese family, and I really wanted to escape that fate, but I couldn't see any way to do it. All that I had was this crushing sense of being adrift at sea and not knowing how to get back to shore. I could see the failure. I could see that I had no plan, that I no longer knew how I was going to get where I wanted to go. And I didn't believe that those were things that I could change about myself. They felt like a prison sentence or a mamas. It felt like a death sentence. And it was coming to the realization that I wasn't talented that really forced me to look for a new mindset that would allow me to escape depression because I was coming to the world with my hand out. And as long as I was coming to the world with my hand out, I was at the mercy of other people. And if I wanted to take control, I was going to have to get control of the resources. And in that was a desire to find another way to think about it, another way to think about myself, another way to think about talent, another way literally to think about everything. And I remember saying to myself, listen, pussy, stop asking yourself what the least you need to do is and start asking yourself how much you can bear. I began to develop a growth mindset. I needed to believe that by working really hard, that I could get better at anything. And if that were true, then I just needed to buckle down, I needed to practice, I needed to get good, I needed to do the reps, I needed to put in the effort, I needed to be willing to break myself in half to get so good that people couldn't ignore me. The way to do that, that's it. You need to get out there and do something. Right now, today, literally, stop this fucking video. And whatever it is, if you already have a passion, you are so much farther ahead than the vast, majority of humankind, if you know what that thing is, get out and act. And by the way, if you don't know what it is, act. That's the only way you're going to find out. Go encounter stuff. Go try things. It is in the process of action that you're going to learn the things you need to learn. But if you're just thinking about starting a business, fucking start it. Like, actually build a product right now today. You will learn more, infinitely more, in the process of trying to create it and make it real than you ever will by watching videos, by thinking, by meditating on it, by taking notes. None of it compares. It's not even the same universe. It's just going in. It. One step is better than a hundred hours of pontification. Running a hundred miles an hour in the wrong direction is better than standing still. You'll learn something. So you bring this notion that you're going to end the day with a perfect record. You're going to fail, you're going to fuck up, you're going to try a thousand things, and 999 of them are not going to work. But whatever you want, really, don't ask yourself who you are today. Ask only who do you want to become, and then are you willing to pay the price to get there? Like people are convinced that they, they shouldn't act until they have it all figured out. Fuck that. You should act right now today, no matter how chaotic your vision, no matter how chaotic your life, no matter how much you have going on already, you're working two jobs, three jobs, it doesn't matter. Take an action today that you have a little. This next one is kind of cute, um, but it's something uh, they've actually found a very high correlation with whether children at age five are willing to postpone their gratification for something bigger and better. In this case, um, how many of you know what a marshmallow is? People in this part of the world don't seem to know what it is. You probably have eaten some food with marshmallow in it. There's, I know, at the market here on campus, they have a, a, a like a cookie that has chocolate and uh, chocolate 
kind of cookie on top, a chocolate cookie on the bottom. In the middle is something kind of squishy, and that squishy is marshmallow. It's made out of sugar. It uh, Normally they're white and kind of square like this. You'll see it in this video. Kind of, it's kind of it's not a really high quality video, I'm afraid. Uh, but what they're asking children to do, uh, they, that, the first study in this was done by a Stanford researcher, I believe in the 1980s, um, and he put one marshmallow on, on a plate in front of the children and said, you know, individually, not as a group, but individually, put that marshmallow in front of the plate and said, if you don't eat this marshmallow in the next 15 minutes, I will come back and give you another one, and you get two of them. Um, the test is delayed gratification. Can you postpone your gratification now for something better later? In this case, with five-year-olds, it's just asking, wait 15 minutes before you eat this candy. If you, if you can wait, you get two candies. Can you wait? Can you postpone your gratification for 15 minutes? They then tracked those students through high school and found that the students who were best able to resist temptation uh, and not eat that marshmallow during those 15 minutes were the ones that were most likely to succeed later. Now, uh, I will follow that up with another one by a more recent study that the researcher calls grit. And she's she believes that that even if you eat the marshmallow when you're five, that doesn't condemn you for life. Um, that there is something that she calls, I would say it's basically the same as delayed gratification, more or less, or correlates very strongly with it, that she just calls grit. Are you willing to grit it out? Are you willing to, to uh, tough it out? Um, and uh, anyway, she, again, she, she finds that she can ask, she can, basically ask a questionnaire, you know, pass, give students a questionnaire or whoever, uh, military personnel, other athletes, give them a, a written test to decide whether or not they're going to fail. Uh, and it's based on basically a lot of it is delayed gratification still. Uh, how much grit do they have? How much, uh, are, how, how much effort are they willing to put in? How, many sacri how much sacrifice will they make to, to achieve success? So I'm going to do both, both these. The first one, again, the short one about the marshmallows. I'm here because I have a very important message. I think we have found the most important factor for success. And it was found close to here, Stanford. A college professor took kids that were four years old and put them in a room all by themselves. And he would tell the child, four year old kid, Johnny, that's a marshmallow. Here with a marshmallow for 15 minutes. If after I come back, this marshmallow is here, you will get another one. So you would have to, to tell a four-year-old kid to wait 15 minutes for something that they like, it's equivalent to tell them, we'll bring you coffee in two hours. Exactly equivalent. So, what happened when the professor left the room? As soon as the door closed, two hours later, eight months later. Five seconds, ten seconds, forty seconds, fifty seconds, two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, so lasted fourteen and a half minutes. Could go. Could go away. What's interesting is that one out of three would look at the marshmallow and go like this. We we'll look at it, put it back. They will walk around, they will play with their skirt and pants. That child already had four understood the most important principle for success, which is the ability to delay gratification. Tell this the most important factor for success. Fifteen years later, 14, 15 years later, follow study. What did they find? They went to look for these kids, they were now 18 and 19. 
And they found that 100% of the children that had not received the money were successful. They had good grades, they were doing wonderful, they, they were happy, they had their plans, uh, they had good relations with the teachers, students, they were doing wonderful. A great percentage of the kids had 80 marshmallows, they were in trouble. They did not make it to university, they had bad grades, some of them dropped out, a few had, were still there with bad grades, a few had good grades. I had a question in my mind. Were well, Hispanic kids reacting the same way as the American kids? So I went to Colombia and I reproduced the experiment and uh, it was very fun. It was four, five, and six years old kids. And let me show you what happened. Hasta tal punto de cuatro años, esa cantidad de gente tenía el 6% por ciento de retorno a la inversión en pequeños niños. Sin embargo, algunos de ellos, tan pronto la puerta que cerró, se perdieron en el suelo sin tirar a mí. to banking, for example, or working in a cash register, but she will be successful. And this applies for everything, even in sales, the salesperson that, that uh, 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 the customer says, I want that, and say, okay, here you are, the person is my person. If the salesperson says, wait a second, let me ask you this question, if you give me a good choice, then you sell a lot more. So this has, this has uh, application to all walks of life. I end with uh, the Koreans, did this, you know what, it's not good, we want a Marcelo book for children. And they, we did one for children, and now it's all over Korea, they're teaching these kids exactly this principle, and we need to learn that principle here in the States, because we have a big debt, we're eating more Marcelos than we're producing. Thank you so much. So, I, I know other studies have also shown uh, the importance of delayed gratification. Can people delay their gratification? Uh, if you can't, this is problematic. Um, the next person, like I said, this other video, the person says that you can train yourself. Children can be trained. People can be trained to delay their gratification. But it's kind of, in some ways, a little discouraging to think that you can predict somebody's future when they're four years old and whether or not they'll eat a marshmallow. Um, but uh, uh, again, Stephen Covey, his book is all about how you overcome yourself in some cases, overcome the circumstances, overcome your rearing. Uh, I think a, a lot of the children that probably would not resist eating the par marshmallow, maybe their parents readily gave in to them. Whenever they wanted something, they got it. Um, they didn't, they never asked to wait and be patient about anything. But uh, Stephen Covey says basically, hey, don't blame anybody else. You take charge of your life right now, you decide 
what you want to be, what you want to do. And so he would have a response to this. Um, and maybe not directly, but indirectly, he does respond to it. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at this uh, other one then. 27 years old. I left a very demanding job in management consulting for a job that was even more demanding, teaching. I went to teach seventh graders math in the New York City public schools. And like any teacher, I made quizzes and tests. I gave out homework assignments. When the work came back, I calculated grades. What struck me was that IQ was not the only difference between my best and my worst students. Some of my strongest performers did not have stratospheric IQ scores. Some of my smartest kids aren't doing so well. And that got me thinking. The kinds of things you need to learn in seventh grade math, sure, they're hard. Ratios, decimals, the area of a parallelogram. But these concepts are not impossible. And I was firmly convinced that every one of my students could learn the material if they worked hard and long enough. After several more years of teaching, I came to the conclusion that what we need in education is a much better understanding of students and learning from a motivational perspective, from a psychological perspective. In education, the one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. But what if doing well in school and in life depends on much more than your ability to learn quickly and easily. So I left the classroom and I went to graduate school to become a psychologist. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling League and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods, asking which teachers are still going to be here in teaching by the end of the school year. And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking which of these salespeople is going to keep their jobs? And who's going to earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is thinking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. A few years ago, I started studying grit in the Chicago public schools. I asked thousands of high school juniors to take grit questionnaires, and then waited around more than a year to see who would graduate. Turns out, that grittier kids were significantly more likely to graduate, even when I matched them on every characteristic I could measure. Things like family income, standardized achievement test scores, even how safe kids felt when they were at school. So it's not just at West Point or the National Spelling Bee that grit matters, it's also in school, especially for kids at risk for dropping out. To me, the most shocking thing about grit is how little we know, how little science knows about building it. Every day, parents and teachers ask me, how do I build grit with kids? What do I do to teach kids a solid work ethic? How do I keep them motivated for the long run? The honest answer is, I don't know. What I do know is that talent doesn't make you gritty. Our data show very clearly that there are many talented individuals who simply do not follow through on their commitments. In fact, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. So far, the best idea I've heard about building grit in kids is something called growth mindset. 
This is an idea developed at Stanford University by Carol Dweck, and it is the belief that the ability to learn is not fixed, that it can change with your effort. Dr. Dweck has shown that when kids read and learn about the brain and how it changes and grows in response to challenge, they're much more likely to persevere when they fail because they don't believe that failure is a permanent condition. So growth mindset is a great idea for building grit, but we need more. And that's where I'm gonna end my remarks because that's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas, our strongest intuitions, and we need to test them. We need to measure whether we've been successful and we have to be willing to fail, to be wrong, to start over again with lessons learned. In other words, we need to be gritty about getting our kids grittier. Thank you. Marshmallow one, uh, that somehow people are doomed by the time they're four years old. Uh, and too much could even be discouraged by by this grit uh, researcher because she admits she doesn't know how to give somebody grit. Um, I'll let you quote somebody. But basically, to give somebody grit, you have to start off with them believing that, that failure is not the end, that they can keep working, that that, uh, that it doesn't, they, they don't have to be the smartest person to be successful. Kind of like the the guy that's a uh, millionaire that's talking about take action, action today. Um, you know, he became a millionaire. Um, but at that point, you know, he was, when he was younger, he had as close as he'd given up. Uh, he didn't see how he could get from where he was at to where he was going. So it was biological. He had a family of people that were overweight. He was overweight. He saw himself as a loser. Uh, he didn't think he was particularly smart. He didn't think he had anything, any tools with which to achieve success. Um, and it sounded like he started with with biologic part, that he could control something. He could start work harder. He could go to the gym. He could do whatever he had to do to work on that. Um, and then he took that same attitude into learning other things, starting businesses, and being willing to fail, um, and not be afraid of failure and ultimately end up you know, where he is today. Um, I think I'd do one more and then, uh, and then uh, how many people know, uh, let me ask this question, how many of you do not know how to get onto the Moodle site, into the e-learning site? Anybody here not know how to do that yet? Uh, I, I'll, I'll be glad to teach that but I have to know whether you need me to teach that. Um, the, uh, I did in the previous video, I did video record the previous uh, lesson and I did go through that. Uh, so it is on the e-learning site already, but you have to get to the e-learning site to watch the video or you have to get it from me. Um, so it's uh, it's not too hard. Maybe I will take just a couple minutes after this video to, to run through that uh, very quickly. I'm going to go ahead and watch, uh, you know, go through one more. Uh, let see which one do I want. How about uh, Slice Malone, Professor Sloan, Rocky? Rocky's story is this even, right? But Slice is too. Slice is a good friend of mine. And when I first met him years ago, I was to my JT stuff, he invited me over to dinner, we started talking. And I said, you know, I've heard your story from other people, but I really love to hear it from always to now. I don't know how much is mythology and an urban myth and how much is true. So he told me his whole story. He said, the essence of it, though, was. He said he knew his whole life what he wanted to do since he was very, very young. He wanted to be in the movie business, period. I mean, not just TV, movies. And he, just, he said why was, for him, it was a chance to have people not only escape, but to inspire people. And by the way, that drive is what made most of his movies, inspire people to what they're capable of, overcome unbelievable obstacles, because in his own life, he felt like he did that. When he was born, he was pulled out by the forceps. That's why he looked the way he did. That's why he talked the way he did. And he said, so I really want to do that. And he said, I knew why I want to do it. I wasn't going to sell something out. And he said, what happened was, I went out trying to get a job, and it's not like I went, hey, and they went, you, you're a star. It didn't work out very well. They looked at me and said, hey, you're stupid looking. Do something else. You know, we just talking about this. 
There's no place for you in that stock. You're never going to be a star in the movies. You're insane. No one's going to listen to somebody who looks dopey and barks out the side of their mouth. Right? And you got no after no after no after no. He said, I was thrown out more, more than 1,500 times in agent's offices in New York. I said, there aren't 1,500 agents in New York. He said, I know. I've been on five, six, seven, eight, nine times. He said, I remember one guy I went in there, and I got in there at 4 o'clock, and he wouldn't see me, so I stayed there, and I would not leave. I stayed overnight. He came back the next morning. I was still sitting there. He said, that's how I got my first job. The guy said, fine, come in here. And he sat down, and he went through this, and he gave my first movie. I said, oh, really? I thought Lockheed's first movie. He said, now this other movie, I've never heard of it. He said, I said, well, what character you play? He said, well, I was in it for about 20 seconds. I was a thug and somebody beat up. He said, because that made me feel like, you know, some of the people hate your guts. You get beat up, it'll be a good thing. And he did like three movies like that. Never got it in it. Kept going out. Rejection, rejection, rejection. So finally he realized it wasn't working. So he changed his approach. He said, I was starving, by the way. He said, I couldn't pay for even to have heat in my apartment. My wife was screaming at me every day to go get a job. I said, well, why didn't you? He said, because I knew that if I got a job, he said, I get seduced back and I'd lose my hunger. He said, I knew that the only way I could do this is if it was the only choice, if I burned all of the bridges. Because if I did a normal job, pretty soon I'd be caught up in that rhythm and that stuff, and I'd feel okay about my life, and I'd feel like my dream would just gradually disappear. He said, I wanted to keep that hunger. That hunger was the only thing I thought was my advantage. He said, my wife didn't understand that at all. He said, we had these vicious fights. He said, it was freezing. So I was broke, we had no money. And he said, so I finally went to the public library one day because it was warm. So I didn't want to read anything. So I went in, New York Public Library. So I was hanging out there. I sat down in this chair, and somebody left a book there. And he said, I looked down at this book, and it was the poems of Edgar Allan, stories of Edgar Allan Poe. And he said, so I started reading it. He said, I got totally into Edgar Allan Poe. He said, I knew everything about it. He was on for another 20 minutes telling me about Edgar Allan Poe. He knows everything, how he died, what it was about, what really happened. And I said, well, what did Poe do for you? He said, Poe got me out of myself. He got me to think about how I could touch other people, not worry about myself so much. And he said, then he decided to become a writer. I said, just imagine Rocky the writer, right? And he said, so I tried to write a bunch of screenplays, nothing worked, nothing worked, I was totally broke. He said, I didn't even have 50 bucks. And he said, finally, he said, I sold a script. It was called Paradise Alley. He said, it's a movie I made many years later, but I sold it. And he said, I sold it for 100 bucks. He said, but 100 bucks was a ton of money, man. I was so thrilled. I thought, I'm on my way. But it never left anything. And he said, so finally, he said, I kept going and going and going. He said, finally, you're so broke. He said, I hawked my wife's jewelry. He said, Tony, there's some things in life you should never do. He said, that was basically the end of our relationship. She hated my gut so much. He said, now we were so broke, we had nothing, no food, no money. And he said, the one thing I love most in the world was my dog. He said, I love my dog because he gave me unconditional love, unlike my wife. And he said, so what happened was, though, we were so broke that to survive, I couldn't even feed my dog. So I went to a liquor store, he said, the lowest day of my life. And I stood outside the liquor store trying to sell my dog to strangers. He said, I tried to sell my dog for 50 bucks. And he said, the time there's one guy negotiated with me and bought my dog for me, my best friend on earth, for $25. He said, I walked away from there and I cried. He said, it was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. He said, two weeks later, I'm watching a fight between Muhammad Ali and Webker, this white guy that's getting bludgeoned, but just keeps on coming. And he said, I got an idea. He said, I, as soon as the fight ended, I started writing. He said, I wrote for 20 straight hours. I did not sleep. I wrote the entire movie in 20 hours straight. Right then, saw the fight, wrote the movie, whole thing, done. He said, I was shaking at the end. I was so excited. He said, I really knew, man. I knew what I wanted. I knew why I wanted it. He said, just like you teach that formula. He said, but I said, man, I took the action. Now it's time to deliver. And so he said, I went out and started trying to sell it to agents. And they all would read it. And they'd say, you know, this is predictable. This is stupid. This is sappy. He said, I wrote down all the things they said, and I read them the night of the Oscars when we won. Uh, it's, it's really good, right? The greatest revenge is massive success. <laughs> and he said, so what happened was, he said, I kept going, trying to sell it, trying to sell it, and we go, and I'm broke, I'm starving. He said, finally, I meet these guys, they read it, and they believe in the script, and they love it. And they offer me $125,000 for my script. I said, oh my God, you must have been out of your mind. He said, I was. I said, just one thing though, guys, you got a deal based on one thing. They said, what's that? He said, I got a star in it. They went, what are you talking about? You're a writer. He said, no, no, I'm an actor. He said, no, 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 you're a writer. 
So, no, no, I'm an actor. That is my story, and I'm Rocky. He said, I gotta play it. You know, I gotta be the head person. I gotta be the starring role. And said, there's no way we're gonna pay you $125,000, take some no name, stick you in that, throw our money away. We need a star. You know? And they want to have Ryan O'Neill play Rocky and give you pictures. Can you imagine? That's who they picked, right? And so he said, no way, Ryan O'Neill is a Rocky. I'm Rocky. We'll do this whole thing, right? And they finally, he said, they said, well, take it or leave it. He said, I left the room. I said, if that's what you believe, you don't get my script and left. Here's a man with no money, none, totally broke, offered $125,000 more money to see his lifetime. He walked away because he knew his real what? Knew his real what? And why he wanted, he was committed to it. So he said, they called him a few weeks later, and they came and brought him back, and they offered him a quarter of a million dollars not to star in his own movie. He turned it down $250,000. They came back to my office $325,000. They wanted this thing. He said, not without me. And they said, no. They finally compromised, and they gave him $35,000 and points in the movie. They said, if this is going to happen, then you're going to take the risk with us. And the bottom line is, we don't think it'll work. At least we won't spend a bunch of money on you. And they only spent a million dollars to make rock, and it grows $200 million. I mean, it was done pretty well. What's interesting about this is, here's, I said, what'd you do? I mean, even 35000 it's not a quarter of a million. That's a lot of money when you don't have 25 bucks. I said, what's the first thing you did? I heard you went out and partied or something. He says, I went to that liquor store for three straight days and hoped that the man that had my dog frequented the store. He says, I want to buy back my dog. I thought, that was so cool, right? That was really cool. I said, what happened? He said, the third day I was there, this guy walks by, and I see him, and I can't believe it, there's my dog. And I looked at him and I said, sir, remember me? And he said, it's been about a month and a half by the time this had all come about. And he said, remember me? And I'm the guy that was in the dark. He goes, yeah, yeah, I love the dog. And he said, look. He said, I was so broke. I was starving. He's my best friend. I'm sure you love him too. But I gotta have him black. Please, I beg of you. He said, I'll pay you $100 for the dog. I know you paid me $25. I'll we'll give you $100. And the man said, absolutely not. No way. My dog, man, I can't buy him back. I, and that's why I said, you know, Tony, you know how you say, know your outcome? I said, yeah. He said, I knew it. He said, I kept changing my approach. So I went, $500 for the dog. The guy said, absolutely no way. He said, $1,000 for my dog. The guy said, no more money here is ever going to get this dog for you. I said, what did you do? He said, I knew my outcome, right? Because he listened to the stage trip to him. He said, I said, I take massive action. He said, I got my dog. I just kept changing my approach. So I got it. I said, what it cost you? $15,000. And a part in Rocky, the guy in Rocky. You know that dog in Rocky, Butt Kiss? That's Sly's real dog, right? That's the dog. You find that? So, so he put his dog in the movie, and he put the guy in the movie, and made 15 grand when he had 35,000. Isn't that pretty cool? Pretty awesome. So there's always a way if you're committed. Just gotta keep changing your approach. Just gotta keep changing. Well, that's the story of Rocky and Sylvester Stallone. Uh, very, almost the same story in a sense. Uh, in the sense that the perseverance that Rocky, the movie character, displayed was also Sylvester Stallone's own character that he that he uh, had to develop in, in, in achieving his success. Okay, well, just very quickly, for those that uh, uh, don't already know uh, how to handle... Uh... Okay. Let's go through real quick here. Um, if you haven't gone into Moodle, um, you'll need a a passcode or a password or a key and ours is success 2017a um, you can start by going to the main site I don't want to start over again but anyway the main website and uh, up in this area it's, there's a uh, link called library click on that that will take you to the library site and in the library site there's a link here called, uh, what, information, I believe. Um, yeah, let me just call it up. That may be better. Okay, so you go to the main website, hit library, takes you there, go to information, 
and that takes you to Moodle. Go to Moodle, it gives you some instructions here and gives you a link to the, to the uh, Moodle site itself. Moodle is an e-learning site, uh, as I mentioned. Um, and it gives you some instructions. Uh, go to the uh, e-learning site itself. That takes you to the front page. And if you scroll down, there's a uh, Moodle quick guide. And so you can click on that and that will give you some instructions. Then you go down a little further, uh, Moodle quick start for students. And that even the show me how is a video. It shows you how to, how to sign up to, into it. Um, but basically if you then uh, use your own ID and password to hit go into the login, um, I, I can't show you because it already knows me. It's kind of hard for me to, to not be me in this case. Um, but if you get there, once you start try, uh, you, you can sign in with your ID and your password, your regular one that you use for everything else on campus, um, and then uh, find the, the course. Uh, this is, uh, I have two sections, so this is section one. And your password, therefore, ends in an A, whereas the second section tomorrow, the, the, the password ends with a B. So success 2017A is the passcode. And again, this will kind of show you, uh, you know, let me just, again, this takes you to a YouTube video. And it, it demonstrates uh, all of this. But... Uh, uh, basically, again, the, the key is once you click on the course, if you haven't already enrolled, it's going to ask you to enroll. And so uh, it's self-enrolling. And, and uh, uh, so you use uh, your the password I just gave you, the success, capital S, success, um, 2017A for this section. Again, you're going down, you're finding, finding the course. Uh, in this case, it's showing it with something else, but you'd be finding it uh, under the, the uh, uh, general education uh, section uh, of, the, of that front, front page. You look up our course, success strategies, um, section one, and then uh, you will as it shows here, uh, in the process of showing that once you uh, uh, click on it, then you've got the enrollment key. You click in here, you put in your the, the success 2017A, get it open. And then you can go back and, and then you can go in and get the contents. You can take quizzes, you can upload uh, your, uh, your weekly. Um, Self-reflection. Uh, it's you know you'll get it. You'll see the link. It's pretty much once you're into it. It's pretty much self. Um, well, it's pretty obvious. You know how to do things. The quiz comes up, and that, that, it's pretty easy. It'll tell you how to work your way through. And, and, and same with uh, if you have to, when you upload your your self-reflection, you click on the the uh, the activity, the self-reflection activity, and it has allows you to upload. Uh, your Word document into it, or you can just type it in. Uh, it doesn't allow you to type it in there, or copy and paste there. Um, but however you want to submit it by uploading um, or copy and pasting that week's segment into uh, the, the, the box they give you. Either way, it doesn't matter. Okay. Any questions on anything? Not the right time. Um, hopefully. Uh, you, you know, you kind of get a glimpse of what we're pursuing here, but we need to pursue it systematically, and that's what uh, what the Stephen Covey book will let us do. It takes a look at it step by step. We understand the raw raw part of it. We need to believe that we can do this. We need to put make an effort into it. All these videos are nice that way. We see other people succeed it, but now we need to figure out, you know, step by step, how do we get from where we're at to where we want to go. And part of that, Stephen Covey, his uh, second habit is begin with the end in mind. 
that you have to know what it is you're after. And so the question I ask today is what is what does success look like to you? Uh, because you can't get where you want to go until you know what you where you want to go, right? Um, as I shared in the previous class, got a battery. Uh, as I shared in the previous class, uh, one of the stories that that uh, Dr. Covey shares is the that a crew is out in a jungle, out here in the jungle of Malaysia, let's say, and, and they're building a road. Their, their commission is to build a road from where they're starting to some other city or whatever, through the jungle. And so they go out there with their chainsaws and with their equipment and with their machetes and they're, they're cutting through the jungle and uh, chopping down the trees. And, and uh, after you know, many days of hard work, Somebody climbs up a tree and looks out over the jungle and he yells down, We're going the wrong direction. And people down below say, Yeah, but we're making progress. Um, well, that kind of goes back to what one of the other guys was saying. If you you know, if you tip your you can make progress and not get to where you want to go. And so you need to know where you're going. What does success look like to you? Uh, okay, you can't get there without having an idea where you're going. So uh, the, the first thing I really want you to think about um, this week and maybe reflect on is what is success to you? What does it look like? Uh, I will put up, I think, two other videos. They're fairly, fairly short. Um, yeah, maybe together they might take you 40 minutes to watch them. One of them is a little bit longer, I think. It uh, might be fair, about 30 minutes. Uh, but the two of them, one of them uh, is... Uh, a sociologist who has studied uh, happiness and what leads to happiness, and and one from last week probably also studied that from you. And the other one is by this Clay Christensen. Uh, he uh, I like to have to write all these books about how to teach, to teach success in business. He wrote a book about what is success look like, you know, what, what, how do you measure success. And talk more about the other elements of success besides a big job or a job or fame, any of those things that, that you might be thinking about as you're watching the video. Um, what does success really mean? And so some of the videos I'm asking to watch help you consider all those things. Now, in the case of Clay Christensen, I'll tell you, maybe give away the punchline a little bit. Right from the very start, he did something that I would be afraid to do. Um, that his first job out of his after his master's degree, I believe it was, he was already you know, he was looking for a, a, a consulting firm, and his boss asked him to come in on Saturday to do some additional work. He said, "No, I will give you as much time as you need, all my effort, five days a week on Saturday, and Sunday that's for my family." And so. He took a chance right there. He set his standards. You know, you're important. And I will give you five days a week. But two days a week, you can take my family. Um, that was pretty gutsy, I thought. And I'm not sure I could have done that. Um, stretch out of school. But anyway, um, so that's how he, he decided to balance his life. And he was looking. But uh, five days a week, two days a week, he stuff with his family that, were, that would keep the family together while his colleagues that graduated from Harvard and Oxford and so forth that he went with were losing their family despite achieving great success in life. So, anyway, that's something to ponder too. And these other, these other uh, uh, videos that I've asked you to watch, that I will ask you to watch, Reflect on that also. Uh, so, thank you, and we'll see you next week.